I'm Avery Clues. Welcome back to Exeter Cosmos. Have you ever wondered what types of projects students interested in space are pursuing? Today, you'll hear from John and Mahir, two students who recently attended the Broadcom Masters competition and won the Lemelson Innovation Prize. Then, you'll hear from Owen Dugan, a student enrolled in Stanford Online High School who does research. Finally, you'll hear from Anna Humphrey, a student who recently won the Science Talent Search competition. These projects are great examples of students pursuing their passion in space. Enjoy. Hi, my name is Nihir Joshi. And my name is John Madlin. And for our project, we did a Torella Aurora experiment. A technical demonstration of charged particle shielding for space exploration. In 2010, the President of the United States suggested that by 2030, we would be able to send a manned mission to Mars. A current major issue with the exploration of Mars is the levels of radiation. Our project focuses on the main type of radiation, solar radiation. This radiation consists mainly of charged particles, which can be easily deflected by a magnet. To make our project on Earth, we needed to find a way to simulate the vacuum of space on Earth. To do this, we used a two-stage HCFM vacuum pump, and we used a homemade vacuum chamber. To simulate the sun, we used a thermionic cathode, which we heated with a small transformer. To accelerate the electrons and charged particles from this cathode, we used this larger transformer, which puts out 9,000 volts. We current limited the output to 5 milliamps to keep it safe. We also needed to simulate Mars. To do this, we used a magnetosphere, which had two ceramic magnets in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere of this steel ball. This whole mechanism that we built is called a Torella. As you can see here, this is our vacuum pump, and that leads to our homemade vacuum chamber, which consists of a cooking pot and a silicone seal. We have two valves right here, this one is to release the pressure, um, and this one is to control the vacuum flow. This gauge tells us how strong the vacuum is. However, we usually have an acrylic lid on top of it to seal the vacuum, but we took it off for the video. This power supply we built here is used to heat up this filament, and also used to attract the electrons to the ball from the filament. This is our magnet shield. This would be placed in Mars's orbit to deflect the charged particles. was a success. Not only was our hypothesis right, but we were able to identify a distance that would give us an optimum protected area on the surface of Mars. However, this isn't the end of our project. Our next steps would be to explore the technological feasibility, economic feasibility, and the long-term sustainability of this project. We have learned a lot since we started this project, from understanding the limitations of our model to determining the next steps of research in the areas of astrophysics and the long-term impact of radiation exposure on humans during space exploration. We look forward to updating you on the research of this project. We hope to be a part of the engineering team that makes it possible to travel to Mars. When you're ready to travel to Mars, we'll, we'll make, make sure, sure you're, you're safe. safe. Hi, I'm Owen Dugan, and I go to Stanford Online High School. Last year, the team of two other students, we took measurements on a particular double star known as WDS 07106 plus 1543, which is located in the constellation Gemini. We took photos of it and measured the relative position of the secondary star relative, relative to the primary star. We plotted that uh, along with past measurements, and we noticed that relative position of the secondary star relative to the primary star seemed to fit a line better than it did the orbit 
that had been ascribed to it. So we set out to try to see if we could find more evidence for that and reclassify the double star from a true binary to an optical double. We used a gradient descent algorithm to find the best fit linear solution for our system, which gave a really good result of an R-squared value of 0 0.997, which meant that the linear fit was really accurate, highly suggesting that it was an optical double and not a true binary. We also got data from the Gaia Space Telescope, which had come down right as we were studying our double star, which was amazing because all the data that was, was there was incomplete or unreliable. So we took this new data and we found that the two stars were moving in different directions in the sky, so they couldn't be orbiting. And also, we found from the Gaia Space Telescope that the two stars were 900 light years apart, which meant that in order for them to be orbiting each other, the primary star would have to be about 10 times the mass of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, which was very unlikely. So, we managed to reclassify our double star from a true binary to an optical double. And that felt really great when our paper got, finally got published and we got, got to feel that we had actually made some contribution to the science of double stars. Hi, I'm Anna Humphrey. I'm a senior at T.C. Williams High School in Alexandria, Virginia, and I was researching exoplanets, which are planets that orbit stars beyond our own solar system, and I was looking to see whether we might be able to find missing planets. So, why would planets be missing? Well, the, way, the most prolific way of finding exoplanets is called the transit method, and the way this works is you imagine you have a star. Now, if a planet passes in front of the star, it'll block some of the light from that star. We on Earth can see how much light gets blocked and then figure out, hey, there's an exoplanet here. Now, that's been, like I said, been very prolific and we found over 2,000 planets this way with the Kepler Space Telescope. But there's a few things that can limit our discoveries. So if the planet goes above or below the star, it doesn't cast a shadow, it doesn't block the light, so we can't find it. Also, if the planet is too small, it's not going to create a big enough shadow for us to detect it, um, especially if the star is really active and just has general a lot of variations in its own brightness. Um, so I, this is why I was looking for missing planets, right? Because there's a good chance that we have a lot of planets that might be missing. Um, so how did I figure out whether we were missing planets? Um, what I did was I looked for spaces where we could fit more. Um, and so what that looks like, imagine we've got our star. And we've got two planets here and here that we know about. What I was looking to see, um, I was looking to see if you could fit a third planet in between without causing the outer two, the inner and outer planets, to their orbits to change. Um, and so basically, this is a function of gravity, right? Gravity is what keeps us down on Earth. It's also what pulls us, um, what pulls planets together. And so if you put another planet in here, you want it to be small enough and far enough away from the ones that are already there so that it doesn't pull those planets off their orbits. So what I was doing was figuring out how big of a planet you could fit here and where you could fit a planet here where it wouldn't change the orbits of the other planets. Um, and so I was actually able to graph this out. And you can see here, um, this is a graph of sort of like the line that tells you the closest that a planet could be. So this line here tells you how close the planet can get to your outer planet. Um, and you can see the graph of that here. And this line graph here tells you how close that imaginary planet could get to your inner planet. So you end up getting this like region of stability that's possible for this imaginary planet. And what I did was take, take those, that region, turn it into a graph using some formulas from the papers that I'd read. And I, um, I figured out any sort of combination of the mass and location of this imaginary planet that I could figure out any of the combinations that you could use um, for, and still have a stable system. Um, and I found that there are 560 places where you could fit more planets and then did a lot of work narrowing that down. Um, so in other words, we have a lot of opportunity potentially to find missing planets. Thanks so much for watching. To learn more about EOPS or to submit a project of your own, feel free to visit www.eops.club for more information.